Hello, this video includes information on introduction to gas laws. We'll talk a little bit about pressure, temperature, and volume, the relationships between those variables, as well as the ideal gas law. When we talk about gases, they are different than solids and liquids in a number of ways. Okay, one way is that um, gases can be easily compressed, which means we can change their volume. That's not true for solids and liquids. Um, they exert a pressure on um, their surroundings, okay, the container that they're in. Um, they expand and fill whatever container you put them in. These are all characteristics of gases that are not um, also characteristics of solids and liquids. Okay, if we have two gases and we put them into a container, they're going to mix completely or uniformly or homogeneously with uh, one another. And when we talk about gases, we can describe them in terms of the temperature, the pressure exerted by that gas, the volume of the container, since the gas fills the container we put them in, and how much gas we have in terms of molecules or moles. So if we were to look here, this is just showing us a container and a couple things of note. Um, the molecules are randomly moving around. Um, when they hit the container, they exert a force per unit area. They, they exert a pressure on the container um, and they fill the container you put them in. So just a little bit of a visual there. So let's deal with um, a pressure. When we talk about pressure, pressure is defined as the force exerted on a given area, or we could say it's the force per unit area. And the SI unit for pressure is called a Pascal. The, the symbol for that would be capital P lowercase a. So a Pascal is the SI unit for pressure. What it means is it's one Newton of force per area in terms of meters squared. So it's a Newton per meter squared, okay? And a Newton um, is often um, defined as a kilogram meter per second squared. Now in chemistry, we typically don't deal with things in terms of Pascals because a Pascal is a really small unit of pressure. We typically talk about them in terms of kilopascals, okay, KPA. And there are a thousand Pascals in a kilopascal, just like there are a thousand meters in a kilometer. So you would much more likely in a chemistry class to be seeing kilopascals than you would be seeing Pascals. In a physics class, if you take that, you're probably dealing more in, in the um, smaller type and you'd be dealing with um, Pascals. Now, some other units you might see, um, ATM is the abbreviation for atmospheres. So standard pressure is one atmosphere. Oftentimes, because of the way pressure can be measured, uh, a unit um, is called millimeters of mercury. MM is millimeters, HG is mercury. So 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one ATM. Um, the way of measuring pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury was um, developed by a man named Torricelli. So sometimes you'll see the unit T-O-R-R -R and 760 Tor equals 760 millimeters of mercury. And then we could talk about it in terms of Pascals and we'd say it's 101,325 pascals, but we typically talk about it in kilopascals. So we would say 101.325 kilopascals. You could also see a bar, although that's very unusual that you would see something like that. And a bar equals uh, 10 to the fifth pascals. All right, so let's talk about atmospheric pressure. Okay, this is um, the setup of a typical barometer. Okay, this is a barometer made out of mercury. This is a barometer made out of water. So what we have, this is um, a, uh, an inverted 
tube, so it's closed off here on the top, okay? Um, and it's in a vacuum, so there's nothing inside this tube. This is a little pool of mercury. And if we were to invert this vacuum tube into this pool of mercury, the atmosphere will push up against the mercury and will cause the mercury to start moving up this small tube. And one atmosphere of pressure will push up against this pool of mercury and move the mercury up this tube 760 millimeters. That's where 760 millimeters of mercury comes from. Now, if we were to do the same kind of setup, but instead of using mercury, we used water and the atmosphere was pushing up against the water, the atmospheric pressure would cause the water to flow up this tube almost 11,000 millimeters, okay? Um, and, and that's because the density of mercury is much greater than the density of water. So typically barometers are made with mercury and not with water because they'd have to be super long in order for us to use water. Now, when we look at um, gases and we want to measure the um, pressure exerted by a gas, we would use an instrument like this. And this is called a bar or, sorry, a manometer. So what we have is um, some kind of gas in this container. And we want to measure the pressure exerted by this gas. Well, this first manometer is actually called a closed manometer. And the reason for that is this part is closed off to the atmosphere. So we have a vacuum here. And if we were to have a vacuum over on this side, the levels of mercury in this tube would be equal to each other. But if we have a gas in this side of our closed manometer, the gas is gonna exert a pressure on the mercury. And it's gonna push the mercury up this tube. The difference in the two heights here is what's used to calculate the pressure of this gas. The greater the pressure of this gas, the more the mercury gets pushed up this tube and the greater the distance would be between these two levels. Now, these two are called um, open manometers. And the reason why they're called open manometers is because they're open here to the atmosphere. Okay, as opposed to this one being closed. So we have a gas here and we have the atmosphere pushing down here. Now, if the gas is pushing at the same pressure as the atmosphere, the level of mercury in this tube would be the same on both sides. But in this example, the atmosphere is pushing with a greater pressure than the gases. So the atmosphere is pushing the mercury up the tube. And we can measure the dis difference in the height. And that would tell us the difference between the atmospheric pressure and the gas pressure. If we know the atmospheric pressure, we would just subtract this value and that would give us the gas pressure. Now in this open manometer, the atmosphere is pushing down here. The gas is pushing down here. They're not pushing with the same pressure. This time the gas has a greater pressure than the atmosphere. So the gas is pushing the um, mercury up the tube. We would find a difference in these two levels, add it to the atmospheric pressure, and that would give us the pressure of the gas. So we have a closed manometer here, and we have an open manometer here and here, and it's an, an instrument that enables us to measure the pressure of a trapped gas in the manometer. So we're going to figure out some relationships between the variables for gases, and we're going to just think about them first, and then we'll go through and look at some math. So let's say that we have a syringe here and the syringe has some air in it. And um, 
the syringe has a particular volume. Okay, volume is the amount of space the gas is occupying. And we were to um, push down on the syringe. Okay, we would squeeze the gas together. We decrease the volume. Okay, in the chat, what do you think would happen to the pressure this gas exerts on the syringe? If we squeeze the gas and we decrease the volume, what do you think is going to happen to the pressure inside that syringe? It's going to increase, right? That makes sense, right? All right, so let's look at another one. Let's say that we have a balloon and the balloon is occupying a particular volume and we cool the balloon down. We put in some, some liquid nitrogen, let's say, okay? We decrease the temperature. What's gonna happen to the volume? It's gonna decrease, right? All right, so let's look at another one. Let's say that we have um, a, a spray can, okay? And we heat that spray can up. Okay, we're increasing the temperature of the gas inside this container. What do you think would happen to its pressure if the temperature goes up? It's going to increase. Agreed. And let's say that we have a balloon and it's got a certain amount of air in it. And then we add more air to the balloon. What would happen to the size or the volume of the balloon? Yeah, it would increase, right? Okay, so those are just empirical relationships. Okay, they're kind of common sense relationships. And when we talk about those relationships, we're dealing with what's called gas laws. So now let's give them names and then put some numbers to them. So the first gas law is called Amontin's law. I usually hear it called gay Lissac's or just Lissac's law. And it has to do with the relationship between pressure and temperature. Okay, like we talked about that spray can and increasing the temperature. Pressure and temperature are directly proportional. Okay, so think about this. Let's say we have a gas in a container and we have some kind of measuring device that allows us to measure the pressure. And we measure the pre pressure when it's in a cold water bath. And then we heat it up a little bit and then we heat it up a little bit more. Well, the pressure is going up as the temperature goes up. Now let's think about why that would be. As the temperature goes up, the particles are absorbing energy. And when the particles in that gas have more energy, they're gonna push up against the sides of the container with a greater force per unit area and the pressure is gonna go up. Okay, these are really common sense. Now, we're gonna assume for gala sachs law that the moles of gas we have are constant. So we're not adding more gas or losing gas from our container. And the volume of the gas is constant, so it can't expand or contract. If we increase the temperature, that increases the pressure. If we decrease the temperature, that would decrease the pressure. It's a direct relationship. Now, direct relationship math-wise could be written something like this. P is for pressure, T is for temperature. K is just a proportionality constant. Okay, so if temperature were to go up, pressure were to go up. If the temperature went down, the pressure would go down. We could also write it in this form, again, where K is just a proportionality constant. And if K is a constant, if our pressure goes up, the temperature has to go up. If our pressure goes down, the temperature has to go down. Well, in these kinds of gas law problems, we're gonna have an initial and a final temperature and an initial and a final pressure. So the equation for gala sachs law is P1 over P2, sorry, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, okay? The ones are the initial temperature and pressure values, and the twos are the final temperature and pressure values, okay? So this is the equation for the relationship between pressure and temperature, or what we call Gala-Sachs law. 
Now, a thing about um, all gas law problems, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. And we mentioned that at the um, very beginning of the course, um, that temperature is um, the SI unit for temperature. And when we convert from Celsius to Kelvin, it's, it's a fairly easy calculation. We take Celsius value and add 273 to it, and that gives us the temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so if the temperature was zero degrees Celsius, it would be 273 Kelvin. If the temperature was um, 25 degrees Celsius, which is uh, about room temperature, um, Kelvin would be 298. Or if we were talking about water boiling, the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, so Kelvin would be 373. Now, if we wanted to graph this relationship, we said it's a direct relationship. As the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. Or we could say as the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down. Now, if we were to extrapolate that relationship down, we would eventually get to the point, the temperature, at which pressure equals zero. And that value is negative 273.15 Celsius or zero Kelvin. And that's actually what absolute zero is. And it's a theoretical temperature, absolute zero. We can get it off of a graph. We can get it from data. It's not something we could actually reach in a lab because if pressure equals zero, it means the molecules are no longer moving and the molecules will always have at least some movement. So let's look at a problem, okay? It says a spray can is used until it's empty um, except for the propellant gas, okay? And the propellant gas has a pressure of 1,344 torr. Again, torr is just a unit of pressure at 23 degrees Celsius. If the can is thrown into a fire and the temperature is now 475 degrees Celsius, what will the pressure of the hot can be? Well, we know that as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. We're gonna expect the final pressure to be greater than 1,344 torr. And because this question is dealing with temperature and pressure values, we're gonna assume volume is held constant and the amount of gas is held constant. So it's a Gay-Lussac's law. So P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. We're trying to solve for P2. Well, to solve for P2, we're gonna to have to multiply both sides by T2. So here's our new equation. Now we just have to plug the numbers in and get our new pressure. The issue though that we have to remember, and you might wanna star it or highlight it or something in your notes, you can never use Celsius in a gas law problem. Celsius is in an absolute temperature scale. So you're gonna to have to add 273 to 23 degrees Celsius, and you're gonna to have to add 273 to 475 degrees Celsius. Okay, temperatures have to be in Kelvin. Okay, so our P1 is 1,344 torr. Our T2, is 475 plus 273. This is what's gonna allow us to convert Celsius to Kelvin. We're gonna divide it by T1. And again, we're gonna have to change it to uh, Kelvin. So we're gonna take 23 degrees Celsius and we're gonna add 273 to that. And when we get our answer, we're gonna get 3.40 times 10 to the third. That's really, one, two, three, 3,400 tour, okay? Um, if we converted that to ATM, there's 760 tour per one ATM. It equals 4.47 ATM. Didn't really ask me to do that. But again, we expected because the temperature's going up that the pressure is gonna go up and it went up a lot. So that makes sense. 
All right, so let's look at Charles' law. Charles' law looks at the relationship between volume and temperature. And when we look at volume and temperature, they are directly proportional, just like pressure and temperature was. So if our temperature goes up, the volume would go up. If our temperature goes down, the volume would go down. Again, we saw this picture before. If we had a balloon and it was filled with some gas and we put it into some liquid nitrogen, the temperature would go down, which would cause the volume to go down. And the reason why that would happen is because as the temperature is going down, the particles have less kinetic energy, which means they're going to be moving around less, which means they're going to come closer and closer together. So the volume is going to be decreasing. Again, this time moles are going to be held constant. So we're not changing the amount of gas in a Charles law problem. And the pressure is going to be held constant. We change the temperature. How does it affect the volume? The equation looks almost the same as Gay Lussac's law. The only difference is we're replacing pressure with volume. They're both direct relationships. And when we look at Charles' law problems, we're going to have a, an initial and a final um, uh, volume and an initial and a final temperature. So we're going to, again, have an equation very similar to Gay Lussac's law, except that we're going to be using V's instead of T's. Again, super important. We're going to put this on a couple of slides. Temperature has to be in Kelvin or you're not going to get the right answer. Celsius is not on an absolute temperature scale. And if we look at a graph here, again, we've got temperature and volume, and we're going to see this direct relationship. And as temperature goes down, volume goes down, and we get to this point here, which is absolute zero. It's the theoretical temperature at which volume equals zero. But volume can never equal zero in reality because in order for volume to equal zero, matter would have to disappear. And matter can't disappear, law of conservation of mass. So absolute zero is the temperature at which volume and pressure equal zero. And it's a theoretical value based off of data collected in a lab, these graphs that we look at, but it's not a value that can actually be reached in a laboratory. So let's look at a problem. Okay, we have some xenon gas and the temperature is 238 degrees Celsius. The volume is 419 milliliters and the gas is heated up, pressure is constant because the volume's changing. And the volume goes to 555 milliliters. Calculate the temperature of the gas. Well, in our heads, just to think about it, the volume was 419 milliliters and now it's 555 milliliters. Since the volume is going up, we're gonna expect our temperature to go up. Okay, well, we're gonna set up our equation Isolate T2, since that's what we're trying to find. Okay, so we've got V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We want to solve for V2. So we're going to have to multiply both. So sorry, we're solving for T2, are we? Yeah, T2. So we're going to have to multiply both sides by T2 and then divide both sides by V1 and T1, or you can just set up a proportion and solve, whichever way is easier for you and then plug in the numbers and see what that final temperature is gonna be. All right, so remember that because you changed uh, the temperature to Kelvin in the problem, it's gonna be Kelvin in the answer. And then if you wanted to go from Kelvin back to Celsius, you just subtract 273. So we have to have the temperature in terms of Kelvin in the problem. Again, we're going to expect the answer to be greater because the volume's greater. It was 238 Celsius. Now it's 400, no, 404 Celsius. All right. So Boyle's law. Okay, Boyle's law deals with pressure and volume. And this is the one that's different than the others because this one, pressure and volume, 
are inversely proportional. Okay, they're opposites of each other. And again, we're gonna hold moles constant. We're gonna hold the temperature constant. If the volume goes up, the pressure would go down. If the volume goes down, the pressure goes up. So our proportionality will look a little bit different this time. If we're looking at an inversely proportional relationship, we would see something like this. Again, where K is just a proportionality constant. So if K is a constant and pressure goes up, volume is going to have to go down to keep it constant. Or if pressure were to go down, volume would have to go up to keep K constant. And in these kinds of problems, like the other ones, we're going to have an initial pressure and volume and a final pressure and volume. But the equation is going to look a little bit different than it did for the other two because pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Okay, so if we were to look at a graph, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. Okay, this is an inverse relationship. Now, what we can do is take the inverse of pressure. If you were to take the values for pressure and just do one over P and graph that, now we get a linear relationship. Volume is directly proportional to inverse pressure. And that's essentially what this equation over here shows us. So let's look at a problem that deals with this. As long as we know what the equations are, out of the four variables, we're given three out of the four. Okay, we end up just doing kind of an algebra problem. So we have a gas. It doesn't matter what the gas is. All the problems have had different gases in them, but it was irrelevant in the question. This time we have carbon dioxide gas. Uh, the pressure is 48 ATM. And um, we've got 13.3 liters of gas. <clears throat> okay, the gas is allowed to expand. The temperature doesn't change. It has nothing to do with the problem. And the volume goes to 21.3 liters. We want to calculate what the new pressure is. So this time we have P1 and we have V1 and V2. How are they related? They're inversely related. So here's our Boyle's law equation. We know P1 and V1. We know V2, we want to calculate P2. Now, in a way, this is a little bit easier because there's no temperature involved. So you don't have to do a temperature conversion or worry about what the temperatures are going to be. Okay, temperature's held constant. Yep, 0.467 should be that answer. All right, so the last kind of basic gas law problem is called Avogadro's number, okay, or Avogadro's law, I should say. Um, and that deals with the relationship between volume and moles of gas, kind of like we have a balloon and we blow it up more and the volume goes up. So moles and volume are directly proportional. Okay, again, we've got a balloon, we put some more air in it, the balloon gets bigger. Okay. This time pressure and temperature are held constant. So we've got kind of four variables that we're working with and three out of four of them um, or sorry, two of them are going to be affected and two of them are going to be held constant. So since volume and moles are directly proportional, again, we're going to look at that same kind of proportionality we had with temperature and pressure and temperature and volume. So Avogadro's law is going to look very similar to those directly proportional relationships. So we've got V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And if we were to graph it, as we increase the amount of gas in a container, the volume goes up, okay? If we decrease the amount of gas in a container, the volume goes down. That's what we mean when we talk about a direct relationship or directly proportional relationship. All right, so this one maybe is a little bit more involved, okay? We've got um, three containers, three balloons, let's say, so that the volume can change. And we want to find out 
which one has the largest volume? Okay, well, in order to figure out which one has the largest volume, it essentially is asking which one has the largest number of moles of gas. So you want to take 8.00 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of oxygen and figure out how many moles there are in that balloon. We need to remember that there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. Okay. And then the second balloon has 25.4 grams of CH4, which is methane. We want to figure out how many moles are in that balloon. So we'd have to look up the molar mass for methane. And then if we have 83.8 grams of krypton, we want to figure out how many moles. The balloon with the largest number of moles is going to be the balloon that has the largest volume, since they're all at the same temperature and they're all at the same pressure. So do those calculations, figure out how many moles of gas are in each of those balloons, and figure out which one has the largest volume. Eight times 10 to the 23rd molecules of oxygen equals 1.33 moles of oxygen. 25.4 grams of methane equals 1.58 moles of methane. And 83.8 uh, grams of krypton equals one mole. Okay. The um, methane, the CH4, has the largest number of moles. That means it has the largest volume since uh, volume and moles are directly proportional. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to combine a couple of things together. Okay, and, and the first one literally is called the combined gas law. Okay, so we know um, we've got um, Boyle's law, okay, that shows us that pressure and volume are uh, inversely proportional. We have um, Charles' law, which is pressure and temperature, okay, knowing that they're directly proportional. We have Gay Lussac's law, which tells us that volume and temperature are directly proportional. And if we were to combine those together, we're going to literally get what's called the combined gas law. Okay, we're just taking P1, V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. We're just taking these and combining them together. That's why it's called the combined gas law. So now, essentially, we're going to have six variables. We're going to be given five, and we want to calculate the missing one. So P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Okay, now again, we're assuming that the amount of gas is a constant. So N isn't in here anywhere. Avogadro's law is not part of combined gas law. So now let's look at the ideal gas law. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna be combining um, gases, gas laws together, but we're gonna add in Avogadro's number or Avogadro's law. Okay, so we've got um, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Pressure and temperature are directly proportional. Volume and temperature are directly proportional. And volume and moles of gas are directly proportional. Now, if we combine those together, we get P times V over N times T. And all of this would equal a constant. And the gas law constant is the letter R. Okay, it's a capital R. It, it stands for the gas law constant. So if we play around with this just a little bit, instead of having numbers in the denominator here, if we multiply both sides by N and T, this is what we refer to as our ideal gas law. P times V equals N times R times T. You use the ideal gas law when you're not changing these different properties about a gas. 
Okay, you would use the combined gas law or one of these individual ones if you're changing pressure and temperature and volume. This is if you're given one temperature, one pressure, one volume, and it's called your ideal gas law. Now, what is R equal? Ooh, that's down a little bit. That should be up a little farther. I can't see that so well. There are three different R values dependent on um, what your units for pressure are. Okay, if your um, pressure is in ATM atmospheres, your R value is 0 0.08206. It's a constant. And the units are liters times ATM divided by mole Kelvin. Now, if the pressure was in um, this should actually say KPA, it shouldn't just say PA. If the pressure is in kilopascals, your R value is 8.314. And if you're talking about it in terms of joules per mole Kelvin, your R value is 8.314. Okay, and, and for now, you'll be, you'll be given these. You don't have to memorize the R values. Um, you just have to make sure that the R values match up with the other units that are in the problem. So let's look, just the last couple of things. We're gonna look at STP. You're gonna see this a lot in problems, okay? STP stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. Okay, so it's defined as zero Celsius and one ATM of pressure. Now remember that zero Celsius is 273 Kelvin. That's what standard pressure is defined as. So we want to show that the volume of one mole of a gas at STP is 22.4 liters. Okay, well, we can use the ideal gas law to do that. Okay, PV equals NRT. If we want to solve for V, we divide both sides by P, so NRT over P. Okay, we want to show that one mole of a gas at STP equals 22.4 liters. So one mole, okay, we're going to use um, 0 0.0821 ATM because we're gonna have our pressure in ATM, one ATM, and our temperature is 273. If we plug that in, one mole of a gas at STP equals 22.4 liters. Okay, that's a constant. It's something that we're gonna to wanna to know that as long as a gas is at standard conditions, the volume will always be 22.4 liters, okay? Does it matter what the gas is? has nothing to do with what the gas is. The gas could be carbon dioxide gas, it could be oxygen gas, it could be methane gas, it could be any gas. As long as the gas is at 273 Kelvin and the gas is exerting one atmosphere of pressure and there's one mole of gas in that container, the volume will be 22.4 liters, okay? It's a constant. 